Would you please all put your phones on silence so that it doesn't show up in the video? I forgot to put mine on silence, so it's real. It's in my mind. So if you would do that, if you want to. Okay, I'm gonna uh, come up here because I have notes, and it'll and I think it'll be easier for everybody to see me. But I might start walking around because I'm kind of an antsy person. Um, I would like to make a couple of announcements and tell you about a few things that I think you probably are interested in and then talk about the um, gun control legis legislation a little bit later so that we can follow that with a question and answer uh, period. So the first thing I want to do, of course, is thank you for inviting me. You guys do phenomenal work and you should be uh, proud of yourselves. I recognize in your face from your faces that many of you were involved in the voters not politicians efforts as well and um, thanks to that we have incredible um, opportunities for higher than ever engagement because it's so much easier uh, to vote today. And in this uh, most recent election where uh, future, soon to be future council member, um, Greg was elected. Uh, we saw record turnout in the city of East Lansing election. In my election last year, we also saw um, record high turnout. There were uh, more, more votes cast for me in November than were uh, cast for uh, um, in, in the primary, there were more votes cast for me than were cast for both Sam Singh and Susan Schmidt in the previous um, open election uh, for this seat. So that just really gives you an idea that um, these efforts at um, increasing voter engagement are successful and that your, your volunteer work uh, has, has measurable effects. So, now you can apply to serve on the Michigan's Independent Citizens Redistricting Commission. So if any of you are interested in that, um, the, the first step in ending the gerrymandering after the laws were changed is the creation of this commission. So applications for the Michigan's Independent Citizens Redistricting Commission are open and you can um, <coughs> visit the uh, Secretary of State website to find more information on in the application. And so that's michigan.gov forward slash SOS if anyone's interested in that. The other thing I'd like to talk briefly about is uh, protecting Roe versus Wade here in Michigan. So we, you may not know this, but Michigan still has a 1936 law on the books that makes abortion a criminal offense. And it hasn't been enforced since Roe versus Wade was, um, was accomplished uh, and made, made, made that uh, old law illegal. So as the mother of three daughters that are growing up here in Michigan um, <clears throat> with ironically fewer reproductive rights than I had you know, 30 years ago, uh, growing up in um, Illinois, uh, I am really uh, honored to have stood with the governor uh, two weeks ago and my colleagues and unveiled the uh, Michigan's Reproductive Health Care Act. So that is a package of bills, uh, we call it an omnibus package, that really goes to um, protect women's rights to reproductive freedom. So earlier this year, <clears throat> House Republicans passed legislation that would ban the safest surgical procedure for second trimester abortions, and they passed that with no exceptions for rape or incest. So this is part of a national coordinated attack on access to reproductive freedom. Currently today, Right to Life is circulating petitions and um, collecting signatures for a ballot initiative that would uh, make this procedure illegal. Of course, we know that uh, the governor is not going to sign the bill that the, the House Republicans passed. Uh, and that is why Right to Life is circulating 
those signatures. What many people don't know is that they have no interest in letting the people of Michigan vote on this important topic. Um, this is going to be an end run, run around us and the governor because there is a, um, a law on the books that says if citizens gather petitions to put something on the ballot, the legis legislature can simply adopt that. And um, the kind of fly in the ointment is that that adoption is not subject to a veto uh, by the governor. So, you know, there's really, there's really only one reason that you would criminalize a medical procedure that's proven to be the safest procedure for patients, and that was if you were seeking to um, ban that medical procedure. And so that's exactly um, what's been happening. In my opinion, it's immoral and um, flagrantly unconstitutional. <clears throat> when it, you know, when it comes to our health decisions, medical science should be the only um, guiding force that is out there. So the um, legislation that has been, you know, the good news is that our cor courts have repeatedly struck down similar bans that have put into place. However, the bad news is that our highest court in the nation uh, now has a different composition and none of us are sure what's going to happen with that. So the um, legislation that's, being, that's been passed and that's being proposed by Right to Life would uh, jeopardize the health and well-being of the women in our lives by forcing doctors to violate their Hippocratic oath because this is the safest medical procedure in certain circumstances. So my, my kids, you know, and countless others are growing up with fewer reproductive rights than I have had at their age. And as I look at um, the national scene, I wonder why is it that certain medical procedures are not afforded to all women um, in, regardless of what method they're using to um, pay for their health care. If you're on public assistance and you're receiving um, Medicaid, you're not, you're not eligible to get the same kind of um, medical treatment that other, other people are. So that is one issue that I just wanted to bring you up today on. Uh, I also uh, have um, every month I have different uh, gatherings where I give legislative updates and I change the times of those. I have a breakfast one, a lunch one, and an evening one so that people with different schedules can make those. So I'll be holding a lunch break on Friday from 12.30 to 2 at Coral Gables this week. And you can look at my website which is simply juliebrixie.com uh, to see a list of upcoming events, but I, I do hold those events regularly. Okay, so now for the, for the uh, issue that is uh, near and dear to my heart, as well as many other people's hearts, I'd like to talk to you about the extreme risk protection order um, legislation that I introduced with some of my colleagues earlier this year. So, um, <clears throat> This is the first extreme risk protection order uh, bill package that has had bipartisan support. And uh, Mike Bouchard from Oakland County, who is a Republican, has uh, signed on, Sheriff Mike Bouchard has signed on uh, to this and is supporting this as someone in law enforcement who recognizes that just as, this is just great common sense um, gun control legislation. So extreme risk laws, which are also known as red flag laws, allow family members and law enforcement to petition a court to temporarily remove firearms from a person's possession if they are found to have some sort of a risk to either themselves or others. So an overwhelming uh, number of American citizens support these types of laws. 
Um, in a recent survey, 85% of respondents favored Congress passing extreme risk law, as well as 78% Okay, I'm hoarse from the game. <laughs> oh, that's okay. I can talk that right. So, um, she went to the other school. <laughs> oh, I see. <laughs> it's okay, I've always heard. <laughs> so, 78% of gun owners also support this legislation, which I think is really saying something because so often we see. Um, you know, people who, who claim to be Second Amendment folks saying everyone who has a gun cares about these things. And that's just simply not true. The vast majority of gun owner, owners support gun control. So um, 17 different states and Washington, D.C. have enacted red flag laws um, authorizing courts to uh, to issue these extreme risk protection orders. Um, and the supporters of the legislation that we have on the books includes Moms Demand Action, Michigan Chapter of the Academy, um, American Academy of Pediatrics, Every Town Gun Safety, and as I mentioned, Oakland County Sheriff Mike Bouchard, who's a Republican. You know, this legislation, I, I don't know about any of you, but I have had um, both family members and friends uh, fall victim to suicide. And this legislation will really ensure that we're able to help our loved ones when they are in their most extreme time of need. So these uh, extreme risk, risk protection <clears throat> orders save lives by allowing a family member um, or a member of law enforcement to help before the, the warning signs that are often present become tragedies. Nearly two-thirds of gun-related deaths are suicides. I lost a nephew um, in this manner, and he suffered from depression and um, while his parents were uh, out of town for a wedding, he took his dad's military uh, service pistol and um, took his own life. Uh, and you know, what's really sad about it is that most people who have depression get fleeting thoughts and those thoughts pass, and many people will recognize that they need help, and they'll reach out and get the help after the thoughts have passed. But the presence of a firearm in the home just makes it, makes it easy for them uh, to do something about this you know, fleeting thought that they have. So when Indiana enacted their red flag laws, they saw a 7.5% decline in the firearm suicide rate. And when C Connecticut enacted theirs, they saw a 14% reduction um, in their suicide rate. These are really serious um, reductions and, and hugely measurable effects that you know, make me very motivated to get uh, this legislation passed. So the other uh, problem that we have besides suicide is that the presence of a gun makes it five times more likely that domestic violence will end in a death. And, you know, sadly, more than half the women killed in the U.S. by guns are murdered by their partners. More than half. I mean, that is just a staggering statistic that I don't know how you could ignore that. So every single month, 50 women are shot and killed in the U.S. by a um, current or former boyfriend or spouse or partner. And um, current research shows that 54% of mass shootings involved a partner or other close family member that was killed. And we know that common sense gun laws like this one will protect domestic violence victims and save lives by giving some means to prevent warning signs. Uh, you know, most of the people who are involved in domestic violence situations 
have probably endured a long time period where they understand their abusers' patterns and recognize that things are getting bad and they're really mad and, you know, tragically, a lot of times the person is getting ready to leave. Um, my, I have uh, two nephews that my brother adopted and he was uh, living in California and had a, um, a, a bookkeeper who worked for him part-time. My brother's a civil rights attorney in uh, Northern California and he had this a woman who was working for him and she was in an abusive relationship and so he said you know you really need to leave and go somewhere safe and so she decided to do that well he helped her and and um, took a uh, wrote up a personal a PPO a personal protection order for her because her husband was really mad at her that she was going to leave and so they you know they got the paperwork filed and they got everything taken care of, and uh, she had a, a U-Haul truck at her apartment, and she was moving out. Her oldest son uh, had graduated from high school, and he was um, away at school, and her husband came over to the apartment with their 12-year-old son and shot her um, in front of their 12-year-old son because he was unwilling to... Uh, allow her to leave. So my brother ended up taking both boys in and uh, they lived with him for about eight years and they're both really terrific kids and they're, I mean, they're successful. They're, they're both married and have children and have, have productive lives. But you know the idea that, that by simply changing laws and allowing guns to be seized in a situation like that could have really been very um, transformative and saved saved that young woman um, a lot, of, you know, saved her life. So, um, <clears throat> in states that require comprehensive background checks, 47% fewer women are shot to death by intimate partners. You know, I think one of the problems with uh, gun control is that so often women who are abused are kind of ignored and swept under the rug and people don't like to talk about it. And I think that's something that contributes to uh, the failure to recognize the epidemic that gun violence really is. Um, so um, in this background checks, we have not introduced legislation yet this year for um, background checks, but I am working on a package. We have a package in the works that we're hoping to introduce before the end of the year. Uh, because we want to close this private sale loophole that exists. You know, if they have these special gun shows, or if you go to Craigslist and buy a gun from another person, there's no record of it. It's insane that, that when I go down to Rite Aid right here to get my Sudafed because I need a decongestant, that I have to fill out a bunch of paperwork and get out my driver's license. And let me tell you, if you left your driver's license in the car, they will not sell that stuff to you. I've tried. <laughs> but I could go buy an automatic rifle. And that's just wrong. That's nonsense, and it's, it's totally wrong, and we've got to change it. So nobody is going to die if they go without their gun for a few days or a few weeks or a few months. No one's going to die if they go to buy a gun and they have to wait for a background check to happen. In fact, uh, people's lives will probably be saved uh, because someone is likely to die uh, if they're suffering from mental illness and their family knows it and they're making threats and we have no way to take guns out of their home. Or someone is likely to die if, they're an, if there's an abusive partner who's making threats and has access to firearms. So these are all really common sense things that we need to make sure that we give give proper consideration for and enact the darn legislation and, and 
give the bills that we have introduced a hearing. Because the fact of the matter is, I think if these bills came up for a vote on the House floor, that there's an awful lot of my Republican colleagues that would be unwilling to look their children's parents, their children's classmates' parents in the eye and explain to them why they think that we shouldn't have these simple, common sense uh, gun control laws on the books. So we have work to do because we need the uh, universal background checks and we need to get these extreme risk protection orders passed. So I would like to open it up for questions and uh, see what you folks would uh, like to ask me, okay? Uh, I'm gonna give you the microphone, John. Who should I write? Mm -hmm. Well, the bill package in the House um, that has been introduced is sitting in the Judiciary Committee, and the chair of the Judiciary Committee is my colleague from DeWitt, Graham Filler, Representative Graham Filler, F-I-L-L-E-R, and I think he's probably on the list because he is a, cap a member of the Capitol Caucus. So it would be perfectly appropriate, John, for you as a member of my district, the 69th district, to write him and ask him to give this um, bill a hearing and to call him. When we lobbied a week or so back, um, many of the members of the Judiciary Committees in the House or the Senate would not meet with people based on the fact that they said, well, they're not my constituents, even though we were wanting to talk with them because they were in on those two committees. So I don't know if there's a workaround with that, and the second thing is, someone asked me recently, is there any kind of a law or a rule, or is it just a procedure that they refuse? I mean, one person said, send me all the names and addresses of the people that are going to meet with me. And we did, and they sent it back and said, none of them are in my district, I won't meet with you. Okay, so... Um Mr. Filler is does not operate his office the same way that I operate my office because I don't ask people um, where they live when they uh, schedule a meeting with me. And I have met with many stakeholders for different issues on different issues that are pertinent to the committees that I serve on. But knowing that that is uh, Representative Filler's practice, I would, I would uh, suggest, is anybody here from uh, Clinton County or DeWitt? Oh, great. You're going to be popular. No. You're going to be popular. You guys are going to be popular because what you can do is uh, you can enlist your neighbors to help and your friends or, uh, who are sympathetic to the cause and you can say, would you be willing to schedule a meeting and we'll do all the talking, bring us with you, and we'll do all the talking. And so if you have three people who live out of the district who are the talkers and one person who lives in the district who cares, that may work for you uh, to, to get your meeting to effectively share your concerns. Now I'd like to tell you some specifics about uh, my bill in this package because last session this bill was intro these this package was introduced and it went to committee and the committee said they wouldn't give it a hearing because they felt like uh, there was not adequate protections for people who were falsely accusing their spouses of abuse okay so the fear was that someone was going through a divorce and they were going to, you know, it was an ugly divorce and they were gonna get back at their husband by calling the police and saying, this guy's threatening me, you have to take his guns away. Um, and so my bill has penalties for that. Severe, strict penalties um, for any kind of false reporting. And that's a really important part of the bill. 
because that's really the only reason and the main reason that people have been, come, been able to come up with to object to um, on why we shouldn't take these steps. That it would just be simply, you know, the idea that it's simply a phone call and they'll come and get your guns. And that isn't how it works. The legislation is designed to work exactly like a personal protection order where you have to have evidence. And you, you can't just make a phone call and say, go get the guns. You have to go before a judge and have a hearing and provide evidence as to what specifically uh, the threat is. It's an extreme risk. It's not just a thought that someone has. Other questions? So I'm trying to think what would constitute evidence because it's, it would be very rare for someone to, for example, on a videotape of these kinds of threats. Um, if you have several people who can testify about this at the hearing, I mean, what, what would be convincing? Well, I'm guessing you've never been in an abusive relationship. <laughs> because the people who are, are not always um, clear thinking. And we have these little things right here, okay? And text messages are evidence. And believe it or not, mm -hmm. uh, people who uh, are abusive right. often send extremely abusive text messages. Mm -hmm. It is a very, very common way mm -hmm. for um, people to verbally abuse their partners. And so text messages are something that have been used um, in personal protection orders, as well as things where maybe there was a witness, you know, someone hit something. Also in the legislation is uh, people who have already been convicted of abuse mm -hmm. and who have a record um, and who perhaps the police have been called multiple times to the home. These are the types of situations uh, that would constitute um, an extreme risk, you know, a repeat offender is certainly someone, uh, and, and typically when people are um, killed by gun violence from their domestic partners, it isn't the first incidence of violence. There's usually been a pattern of violence that just continues to escalate. One more question. Oh. No, just, you have time for one, one more question. question. <laughs> I'm being told we're done. <laughs> So, uh, how do you feel about this child access prevention? Has legislation been introduced? Yes, legislation has been introduced. I'm going to read my phone because I had to ask for the number. Um, it's uh, House Bill 4512 that my colleague, Representative Rebecca Warren, introduced it. And I was a co-sponsor to it, so I believe that it is um, a good piece of legislation. And I think it's safe, I realize I'm being recorded, <laughs> but I, I think it's safe to say that I would support um, many, many, many more extreme measures of gun control than would be probably uh, accepted by uh, the majority of people because I have pretty strong feelings um, about about gun control. And one more, one more question. That was a short one. Representative, uh, we hear a lot from the federal level about the NRA. Is there an NRA presence in Michigan? Because I've never heard of it. Okay. <laughs> well, they they sent me a uh, they sent me a survey, and what a lot of these um, uh, groups do is when you're running for office, they send you a survey. I probably got 400 different surveys uh -huh. um, in the mail while I was running, and they sent me a survey which I threw in the garbage because I didn't care. Although then I regretted it because. Uh, one of my primary opponents proudly was reporting that she had an F rating. I'm like, shoot, I should have filled that out. I would have liked to brag about that. <laughs> that was a good idea she had. 
Um, so they send, they send you surveys out, and um, many of the Republicans are very eager to um, fill out those surveys. And, you know, it's really one of the kind of key fundamental ideological differences, I think, between the parties. Um, but what's interesting is that these, these universal background checks and these extreme risk protection orders, these are things that are common sense that most of us would agree to if we had taken a pledge um, otherwise. I am just really, really optimistic um, that change is coming, and especially from the young people in our country today who have taken and used social media in a way to, you know, get movements and force people uh, and organizations to change their patterns. We've got some great successes. You cannot open carry in Walmart anymore, or in Meyer, or in uh, Joanne Fabrics, or in uh, Kroger, or a bunch of other uh, grocery stores, and that's just people, you know, saying, "Hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna not not shop at your store if you don't do what I want." And the the proof that so many more people believe in these common sense uh, gun control laws than don't believe in them. So I feel very optimistic, and thank you so much for listening to me today. Thank you so much.